It is great to see you. Can you all say good day? Oh, that's nice. It makes me feel like I'm home. Hey, so I'm uh, so thrilled to be here. What an incredible church. And uh, with your uh, 20 services on a Sunday is awesome. Now, uh, it is a wonderful church with your five services, each one so unique and wonderful. And uh, what an incredible pastor. Can we give Pastor Jason a big hand? What, what a blessing to the church. If, if I lived here, this would be my church, I guarantee you. This is a safe church, incredible leadership, a church that's moving, an incredible, an incredible future. I'm so thrilled for you guys, and I'm so excited about what God is doing here in your city, and what a privilege. So my name is Luke. Uh, I'm married to Alyssa Reed. She is from Australia. I'm originally from New Zealand. When I was 14, I moved to Australia, this uh, convict colony. And, uh, and I rescued my wife, and then we came over to America, and we had four children here. We got like the whole UN in our household, and, uh, but we recently, this year, we all, because we all, my wife had a, an Australian passport in New Zealand, and my kids had American ones, so we are all now the citizens of the same country, the United States of America, so we are now American. And uh, so I, I now reside in, uh, in Irvine, California, in Orange County, where we're suffering for Jesus. And uh, that weather is tough, you know. And uh, so eight, uh, we moved eight years ago to Portland, Oregon, launched Resound Church seven years ago. Just this year, recently handed off to uh, Devin Kellen, a great lead guy. We have a, a 50,000 square foot building there, incredible church, an incredible church in uh, Denver, Colorado, with a view of downtown. It's beautiful. And uh, we are launching Resound Church Orange, in Orange County on January 20th next year, so very soon. We just had f- just shy of 500 people last weekend for Christmas. God is doing something really cool and fun, and it's exciting to be a part of a church on the move here as well. So give yourselves a hand. You guys are wonderful. Okay, well, let's dig into the Word of God, Matthew 26. And let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Father, we give this moment to you as we open our Bibles. I pray that you'll open our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name that you'll help us ready our minds and prepare us to be present in this moment. May we be ready to learn from you, grow from you, that we may never be the same again. So in Jesus' name, we just pray for change. Whether it be small change or large change, we just pray for change. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, amen, amen, amen. It says, now Peter, everyone say Peter, Peter. was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. Now this is a crucial moment within the gospel story where Jesus had been dragged and pulled into this kangaroo court and in prison. And he was on this goofy trial, whether he was guilty or not. And as he was going through this trial, it was an incredible salvation story. But in it was actually a lot of lost dreams. And many people thought that Jesus would be a political Messiah, uh, another king of Israel. They did not realize that he would be a spiritual savior of the world. And so at this point, Peter is disappointed, ashamed of his background. Ashamed of Jesus. Actually, Jesus predicted this moment where he begins to deny. Now, if you've been a Christian for some time, you know the famous denial story. If you're a brand new Christian, this is fun that I get to unpack this for the first time. But here's the deal. He stands in front of people in the courtyard as his savior, Jesus' friend, rabbi, was being dragged through an awful moment. And he feels embarrassed. And he says, he starts to deny Jesus. And it goes on to say this, I don't know what you're talking about. But he denied it before all of them. I don't know what you're talking about, he said again. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow, he must have been British, was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know this man. After a little while. Those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. 
Now, I've read this story many times over, and when I've read it, I've mainly read it through the lens of Peter denying Christ and a disappointing moment, a story of grace that's really cool. But one of the things that happened recently is I was reading this story, and something popped at me, something that I had never seen before. They said of Peter, your accent gives you away. Surely, I am sure of it, that you were with Jesus. Not because you look it, but because you sound like it. You sound like someone that has been with Jesus. I'd say for me, I am from Australia. I might, I might look like everybody else, maybe with a little bit of swagger. Come on now. But the reality, as soon as I open my mouth, you know that this bloke isn't from here. This guy is from somewhere else. And I believe this is the powerful message. His accent gives him the way he sounds like Jesus. What did Jesus sound like? He came in truth and grace. I believe we are called to have an accent of Jesus which, listen, this is the title of my message, the accent of grace. We are called to have an accent that sounds like Jesus, where people know that we've been with Jesus. When they're around us, they have no doubt, surely you have been with Jesus. You're full of hope when you should be hopeless. Come on, you're full of faith when you should be doubting. Come on, you're life-giving when you should be down and out. You see, people should know that we've been with Jesus, see your accent, the way you speak says a lot about whom you've been with and where you've been. When you're around negative people, it's amazing that you sound negative. It's amazing when you're around unbelieving people and you are influenced by that. I'm not saying we don't influence unbelieving people, but listen, when we're being the ones influenced, it's amazing how we start sounding like them. When we're around people that are, uh, that are uh, constantly arguing and disgruntled at everybody, it's amazing how we take on those traits. Surely you've been with them. Why? Because your accent sounds like them. You see, I, I'm clearly not from here. Okay, I'm not from Bakersfield, just so you know. This is not a Bakersfield accent, nor is it an Orange County accent. This is an Australian accent. I grew up, and when I was 14, I moved to Australia. It's far more Aussie than it is New Zealand, but it's this weird blend of accent. And, uh, but but my, every time I talk, I, I give it away. People know that I'm not from here. Every time I speak to somebody, it's very evident and when I first moved here, it was kind of fun, actually, that I would talk to people and they'd say, hey, you're from Australia, from somewhere else. Where are you from? And I'd tell them happily because it's kind of fun because back home, I don't have an accent. <laughs> Suddenly, I have an accent, and it's interesting. I'm like, this is cool. And so for the first couple of years, it was wonderful. Now I've been here 12 years and get it about every day or every other day. Every plane ride, oh, you're not from here. No, I'm not. <laughs> then what are you doing over here? Well, I'm a pastor. and then It opens up a new conversation. and It's fine. I love talking ministry. My bad, but sometimes I just want to watch, come on, uh, uh, some, uh, a Jesus film on the plane. Come on now. <laughs> Facing the giants. That's all we watch, right, pastor? Come on now. But your, my accent gives me away. People know I'm from somewhere else. Now, it was very evident when my wife and I first moved over here. When we moved over here, it was so fascinating because we, we realized we both speak English, but it's a different type of English. Uh, we actually don't usually use ours at the end of our words. So, for example, you would say water. We'd say water. Everyone say water. water. It's like an Aussie. Water. Water. You drop the eye, the cool water. <laughs> so water has gone. Aussie water, right? And teaching how to speak Aussie. So we would say, what? Well, we drop the R at the end of a word that has an R in it. And it's weird because I came here. I'm like, oh, there is a use for that R. Like there is, you guys actually use that R. And so it, it's very different, but as subtle as that is, it can get you in trouble. First time we come here, we, uh, we don't say rental car. We say hire car. Right? And so I went to LAX, 
And I was looking, first time I ever uh, drove on the other side of the road was actually in L.A., whoops. And, uh, and so, uh, and so I, I went, we're trying to find the car to drive in and, or, or the rental area. And so I went up to the information booth with my wife and I said, look, I'm looking for the hire cars. And she said, the what? The hire cars. The hire cars. And it was weird because the louder I said it, the, she didn't understand it. I, I couldn't <laughs> grasp that. And so I tried to say the hire car, you know, and, and so we, it was so frustrating. We're both so blank. She was looking up as if I was saying hi, right? Like, I'm like, no, hire car. I went to the point where I had to, to kind of act it out. I was like, you know, the hire car, cha-ching, money exchange for the broom broom. <laughs> oh, rental car. And I realized something in that moment. The, that you are a nation of pirates. <laughs> the car, the water. Everyone go, R, R, American. <laughs> but there is no hiding the fact that I am from somewhere else. And I believe in the same way there is no hiding that you've been with Jesus. The truth is this, is when I don't spend time with Jesus like I should, I start sounding like whom I haven't been with. I haven't been with Jesus. And I start sounding like everything else. The world, my language, I'm a little bit more grumpy and short with people. I'm not grace-filled with other people. I find I start sounding like what I spend most time with. And my wife is so good at identifying it. Now, I've got a good relationship with God. But listen, sometimes there are moments where it gets bland. And that's why you as a church, I'm so thrilled you're going on a fast, a 21-day fast. What an exciting moment to spark that relationship with God a little bit. But here's the deal. There, was a, there have been moments where Alyssa, my wife, will say, you know, Luke, she's so good. She goes, Luke, I think you just need some time with Jesus. Yeah, you know, you're right. I am a little bit shorter than I need to be, a little bit more frustrated than I should be with my kids, a little annoyed at people. And I realized, hold up, my relationship with God is not as healthy as it needs to be. You can't be in the presence of God and have resentment, unforgiveness, frustration of people. You will be full of peace and love and forgiveness. And then your words start reflecting whom you've been with with Jesus. You start developing an accent of grace. You see, the problem is your words are a reflection of your heart. So all your words are, listen to this, your words fundamentally Reveal whom you've been spending time with. It is the check engine light of your heart. What is your heart like? Your words. Listen, when you're not talking out the fruits of the spirit, patience, joy, all that means is the check engine light comes on. And it says you got to take this engine to the mechanic called Jesus. you got to get this heart right. I remember when I was a, a college student, I... Uh, I, I bought this car for $800. There's an ugly uh, brown Mitsubishi Sigma, 1978. And I got sheepskin uh, seat covers. <laughs> that was classy. And, uh, and so I, I, this car, I was great, but I couldn't afford maintenance with this thing. Nor would you want to in a lot of ways. But I had, I had this car, and I was driving. I remember one day the check engine light came on. And I thought, my goodness, I have no money. What am I going to do? So I fixed it. I got one of those yellow, smiley, happy stickers, and I put it on the red engine light. And all my problems went away. You see, that's what we do when our words, our check engine light goes on. We stop pretending that we're okay. I'm going to start doing an Instagram of my happy life and put a happy sticker on this broken engine. We got to go back to the mechanic. 
we need to go back to Jesus. Because if we want to actually sound like Jesus, we got to be with Jesus. If we want an accent of Jesus, if people want to save us, show that you've been with Jesus, we got to be with Jesus to sound like we're being with Jesus. So let's be with Jesus. Let's focus on Jesus. Love Jesus. I'm confident that we create these cages in our lives and disasters because we become self Fulfilling prophecies, we create these negative narratives of our life and people around us. We've got to break this cycle. And Jesus didn't just have a Galilean accent. He had a heavenly accent. A way of saying things and approaching things. Colossians 4, 2, I believe, reveals some of what that accent sounds like. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Everyone say watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace. Have an accent of grace. Season with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. So how do we answer every situation, angry person, frustrating moment, every challenging situation, every crucial moment in our life? We don't react to that situation, but we respond in grace. Season with salt. It's interesting the language here because being seasoned with salt means we take something that is bland and make it interesting. A distinctive. It's different than everything else. What happens if you don't have salt on something? It becomes what? Bland. Now what we're called to do is put salt. Come on, a little bit of hot sauce on that bad boy. And make it the spice of life. That's what we're called to be. We're called to be the spice. We're called to be the pepper of life. Come on, Jesus. We are called to be the curry of life. Something interesting. There's a distinctive to it. It's not bland like everyone else. See, if you want to blend in, talk like everybody else. Complain like everyone else does. No one is that impressed with your trolling or complaining about everyone in your office. Nobody, that doesn't make you interesting and doesn't create a distinctive. People will listen to you. The other issue is people will actually talk with you. Why? Because a complaining negative person is the lowest denominator in a conversation. Everyone can talk to a negative person. But it takes a special type of person to be the one that brings in hope and grace and life. That when you walk into a room, you change the atmosphere. Why? There's something different about you. You're bringing your hot sauce with your words. Come on, you're bringing the flame. You're bringing something different. There's a fire. There's something I like when you walk in the room. I'm an outsider, and I can tell there's something different. That difference is Jesus in your life. Surely you have been with Jesus. Your accent gives you away. This is an accident of grace. You know, mercy is what is a legal term. It's a cousin of grace from a word standpoint. Mercy is a legal term, which means you don't get what you deserve, like a judge giving you mercy. I'm giving you mercy so you don't have to carry your sentence. I'm giving you mercy. Right? It's a legal statement. You don't have to go to hell. Right? You don't, you don't have to live without Christ. These are these beautiful messages that we have in God's mercy. But then there's something called His grace, which isn't just what we don't get. It's what we do get in Christ. It's His unmerited riches, His favor that is on our life. So not only is it about grace being re- us receiving grace, but part of our faith journey is us not just receiving, but us actually giving that grace away. So we give unmerited favor away, meaning you don't deserve my thanks right now. You don't deserve me speaking well of you right now, but I'm going to do it anyway. You don't deserve, I might be upset at you, husband, but I'm going to be God's grace to you right now. And I'm going to tell you how amazing you are right now. Listen, you may feel my wife doesn't deserve this. Come on. Even if you feel that is true, you're going to give it anyway in Jesus' name. It is time to be grace-filled with our discussion, meaning unmerited favor. I'm pouring blessing on you whether you think you deserve it or not. I'm going to be filled with grace in my words. We've all had moments where we haven't been grace-filled with people. 
Anybody here not being graceful with other people? I certainly have not. I've never in my life been grateful for the fact that I was short with people, that I was frustrated with people, that I lacked grace for people. I never, at the end of the day, thought, you know, I'm so happy I got mad at that person. But I've always thought, man, I'm so glad I handled that with grace. I was classy. Come on, I put swagger on my words. Come on, Jesus. Put a pea coat on that thing, make it look good. Come on. Why? Because I've got a language of grace. I remember years ago, I was in this safari, and I was, I was doing a missions trip in Indonesia with church planting in the largest uh, Muslim country in the world. Incredible opportunity. And we had a day off, so we went to the mountains of Begor, and we went through this beautiful safari that has no, like, regulations. It's pretty bad. The lions will actually come up to your car and hit it and play, and it's crazy. I went out and got a photo with the lions just while they're eating. And so I got this photo because I'm stupid. And, uh, <laughs> and then I went back in the car real quick. And we went along, and we went to this one area where there were bears, big bears, huge Southeast Asian bears. And we're going through, and my, my, my brother and all my friends were there. We were, we were on this big trip together. And one of the guys started throwing carrots at this bear. Now, you must understand Australia is a little different than Southeast Asia in most places. Most of what we have are little things that kill you, like snakes and spiders and spiders that jump at you, spiders bigger than your hand, bird spiders that kill and eat birds. So these are nasty little things. In Australia, we don't have many big things, right? And so for us, there's a lack of context, I think, for us. Because when we think of bears, we can think of adorable, cute little koala bears. Beautiful, cuddly koala bears that climb trees and eat all day. Do you know the number one way that a koala bear dies is by eating too much and falling asleep and falling out of the tree? <laughs> like, even in death, it's so adorable. It's... These were not cute little koala bears. My, this guy threw the carrot at the bear and it actually stood on his two legs. Went, wow, that can do that. <laughs> and we had our windows open. And I took a swipe. And in that moment, I had my bag and I actually jumped. We all jumped and I actually uh, made marks on my bag. What's incredible, we walk, we drive up real fast. The driver hustles. In that moment, we stop and look and we're feeling ourselves. We're like, we good? We good? Yeah, <laughs> we did. Because <laughs> that's what men do. We put ourselves in really dumb positions and situations. Then we celebrate it because we lived through a highly risky moment, right? Yeah, we're stupid. Wow. <laughs> High-fiving each other. But you know, one swipe in that moment would have changed my life. One swipe of the wrong words can rob someone of their confidence, change the course. Maybe they won't go for that job. Maybe they won't step out and write that song because you keep tearing people apart. Start that ministry. They feel so criticized that they're walking on eggshells around you and feel so down and out. Can I tell you, the truth is one, one moment can hurt people. They can remember, I remember things said to me as a kid vividly today that was spoken to me 30 years ago. Words matter. But the Bible also says that a soft word, a grace-filled word, turns away wrath. I believe in as much as one word can hurt someone, one word can help someone and bring life. We can weaponize our words or they can be tools to build people up. So what does this look like? I think the key is found in the first part of Colossians where it says, be watchful and thankful. Be aware of what you're saying. Be present. Understand. Have a self-awareness of the way you speak. And the next thing it says is to be thankful. Thankfulness is a type of grace. Jesus would always be thankful before he received something. In the miracle of feeding the thousands, thank you, God, for what's about to happen. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm being thankful. That is a message of grace. I haven't even gotten anything from you yet, but I'm giving you praise. That's a powerful message of grace. Thankfulness is a grace. Whether you deserve it or not, I'm going to be thankful. 
And listen to what 1 Timothy 4.4 says. For everything God created is good. Everyone say good. good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Now let's unpack this. Because I think we can read over this sometimes and not grasp this. That nothing is to be rejected if received with thanksgiving. Another way of saying it is everything will be received if received with thanksgiving. So you will receive whatever you're thankful for. You will not receive, you'll reject anything you're not thankful for. Let me illustrate. During Christmas, we all exchanged presents, right? We all had a big Christmas uh, gift exchange. Now for me, my wife is so thoughtful, she spends hours thinking of a gift for me. She is so thoughtful. And I'm like, Alyssa, honestly, I'm a pretty simple guy. I only require one thing, and that is that it's expensive. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Not that hard, just a lot of money. So imagine if my wife gave me a present on Christmas. She gave me a present. I picked it up, unpacked it. Said, mm, you could have done better. Maybe looked at it. Did you choose this color? Like, what is wrong? Like, were you having a bad day when you got this present? <laughs> like, what sort of stores are you going to? What is wrong? What happened? You were this interior designer in Sydney, and now, imagine if I did that, right? I just complain, criticize. She gives me a gift. Listen to this. She gives me a gift, but I don't really receive it. I reject it because I'm not thankful. What comes out of my mouth is whether I receive that gift or reject it. So you have the giver, and whether you receive it is up to whether you are thankful or not. God gives you gifts all the time. It could be your spouse, friends, your church, people in your world. Here is a wonderful gift. And do you know how, whether we receive that gift or not, is not whether God has given it to us or not, but how we receive it with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, thank you, God, for this spouse. Thank you, God, for what you've given me. That to me paints a different story of your life and the way you receive everything God gives you. Find ways to be thankful. Create ways to be thankful. I'll tell you, my wife is so good. I'll, I'll do things like pull out the groceries from the boot or the trunk. And I'll pull out the grocery bags. And she's like, Luke, is that five bags? <laughs> well, that's right. I'm going to do a sixth right now. I'll change a light bulb. She's like, look, nobody changes a light bulb like you. That's right. As a man, you're like, that's right. I'm useful. I built... Probably my biggest feat of strength as a man where I actually felt like a man, man, where I built a deck, my deck, back in Portland. I was like, man, I'm a real man. And Alyssa was like, this is so good. Yeah, it is. It's good. It's sturdy. Don't worry that it just fell down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was sturdy. But here's the deal, is that she finds a way to be thankful. And do you know what that does to my confidence? Do you know what will happen to your wife's confidence if you're thankful? Be thankful. Find ways to be thankful. And less critical. Thankfulness is the key to you receiving your wife, to your husband, to your friends, your roommates, your church, people around. Find ways to be thankful. Because you can't be thankful and critical at the same time. You've only got room in your brain for one, one thought, one pattern. You're either critical or you're, or you're thankful. You can't be both at the same time. Certainly in God's presence, I can't be critical when I'm in soaking in God's presence. I'm always thankful. We receive by how we're thankful. So let's jump into some key points. I'm going to pop the tray table up, get ready to land this plane. Point number one is understand the weight of your words. Your words have power. Your words have power. Everything you say says something about where you're going. It shapes the future of your life. God says that in the beginning, God created the world with a word. In the same way, you create your world with your words. 
your marriage, your household, your roommates. You, you, you create it. What does that look like when you come home? When the garage door comes home and you're pulling up, mm, garage door comes up. Is that a moment in your family of panic? Oh, no, dad's home. Or is it a sense of dad's home? What do you want? What do you want in life? How do you want others to perceive you? What's done through our words, they matter. Listen, grandparents, if I could speak to grandparents. Grandparents, you can be critical of your kids. Or you can be a blessing to them. You can highlight and talk about everything they're doing wrong or actually lay hands on them and speak about their future, declare who they are in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you what would be incredible if you as a grandma or granddad gave that blessing, that generational blessing, when you lay hands on them and bless them in Jesus' name. We have too many complaining people. The next generation's call and mandate is to bless the next generation, not to criticize it. So bless, but it's reverse also. Our job is to honor older people. Be thankful for who they are. You create your worlds with your words. Churches are broken and they, they grow or fail based off language. I've never been to a church that's thriving and growing like this one where people are debating and arguing over the color of the carpet. Where you see churches like this grow is because everyone's speaking about what God is doing. Everyone are advocates of what Jesus is doing in the city. We become advocates to people around us. I believe your words matter. I, I was a youth pastor for 10 years, a large youth minister of 600 young people. We hit 1,000 people on Wednesday night. And just like two months before we had left. And I can tell you the top thing that pulls kids away from church, you want to hear it? my experience, this is not a scientific research, it's basic, basic observation. It was not parties and drugs and all this stuff that we demonize and we think it's the big thing that's pulling our young people. Can I tell you what it is? Complaining parents. Because you start complaining about how bad your church is and pastor is, everyone at church, everyone hates you, they all judge me, all this and that. What happens is your children actually take your cause and take it further. That word becomes our words. We become speaking what we're reading. That's why we got to soak in the word of God. Immerse ourselves in it. Read it, even if it's 15 minutes every day. Dig into the word. Why? Because you're going to start sounding like what you're reading. The third is practice thankfulness. Be a practitioner of thankfulness. Any married people in the house? Anyone married? Put your hand up. Come on. Any married people? All righty. Any single people in the house, put your hands up. Come on, own it. Single people, come on, hands up. Hands up, that's right. Keep your hands up. Look around. Look around. Good place to meet a potential person. Come on. So married people, I'm going to give you a challenge after this service. When you drive home, I'm going to give you a big, big challenge. When you hop in your car, as soon as you hop in your car, talk about three to four things that you're grateful for with your spouse. Thank you for being such an incredible provider. Thank you for managing our finances. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for, for being an incredible mother. I'll tell you, if you give three or four things to your spouse, and what you will do is you're actually receiving your spouse. You might have been married for 20 years, but you're actually getting, like, really receiving them at that point. Be thankful. The same is true in church. You'll receive everything this church has for you when you begin to be thankful. The fourth thing is your faith is connected to your confession. And all that I've done, whether it be a building in Portland or owning a building in Portland, or buying a building in Denver, incredible churches, what God is doing. I can tell you one thing. It first has to live in my heart, and then it has to come out of my mouth. And it requires both of those things, a belief in my heart and the confession to see those things in my life. 
I believe the same is true for your life, whether it's your marriage, your finances, that business you're called to start. Let live in your heart and become talk, start talking like it. Start talking like it. I had a friend of mine say this to me. Mental, incredible mental when I was about to Luke, do you want to be a pastor? I said, absolutely. He said, well, start acting like one. Start talking like one. thing is talk to Jesus and sound like Jesus. Talk to Jesus and sound like Jesus. Encounter Jesus in a fresh new way. Fall in love with Jesus and then fall in love with Jesus again and again. Encounter Him in worship. Get lost in His presence. Have moments with Him that is beyond. Have a softness of heart. Maybe your heart is just too hard. Get a softness towards the things of God again. Where it's not just karaoke, but it's your spirit. It's a God's spirit. You're engaging to heaven. Listen, the more you do that, the more you get an accent and people around you, your family are going to benefit from your relationship with God. Do you know it is such a selfish belief system to believe that your relationship with God is just for you? What a selfish mentality. Your relationship with God is not only just for your benefit, but so that everyone gets a better version of you. Everyone gets a better version of you. Everyone's blessed by you. So come on, let's fall in love with Jesus so that we can sound like Jesus and we get an accent of grace. You receive that, church? Come on, you receive that word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you could close your eyes and bow your heads, please. Father, I just pray a blessing of every person here. I thank you that we are the head and not the tail. We are blessed and not cursed. And in Jesus' name, I just pray of every person here. Every marriage, every single person, every life here, blessing after blessing after blessing. I thank you that we don't have to chase goodness and mercy, but your word declares that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. God bless your people in Jesus' name. Right now, quickly, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to ask you quickly respond with your eyes closed and heads bowed. I'm not going to embarrass you or put you at the front. If you're away from Jesus, you need to come back to Jesus or to Jesus for the first time. If that is you, without hesitation, I want to know who I'm praying for. And I believe there's a number of people here. I feel it in my spirit. There are people here that need to come back or to Jesus for the first time. If that is you right now, right now, lift up your hand and say, I want to get right with Jesus. All across this room right now, thank you, 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 Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, people are coming to Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, Jesus, thank you. Amen. Once you put your hand up, you can put it down. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Look up at me so I know you know that I've acknowledged you. I want to know what I'm praying for. If that's you, lift up your hand and look at me. I want to know what I'm praying for. Thank you, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Jesus, come on, Jesus, Christians, pray right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Wonderful. Amen, amen, amen. Who else would say yes to Jesus? Amen, amen. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Everyone in this place right now, we're going to pray this prayer of faith. Everyone that lifted their hand or should have lifted their hand, do it all together right now so I know what I'm praying for. Lift it all together right now, right now. Lift it up. Lift it up. Awesome. Come on. Fantastic. Amen. All of us together, let's pray this prayer of faith. We're going to repeat this prayer after me. and We're going to do it so no one's alone. We're going to stand with you and declare this with you. So church, repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me, to make me new. Lord, I turn from what I was and I turn to you. Thank you that you died. Thank you that you rose again. That I may have life and life eternal. And from this day on, the old is gone and the new is come. Never the same again. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's give